Hey, Julie, take a few more feet, a few more feet, and Trevor, you stay six feet back. There you go, six feet distance. No, between you two, between you two. Yeah, yeah, six feet. Is that six feet? I think that's a little close. Okay, there we go, good. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us to talk about what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. Uh, as always, we want to start off by talking about what we're doing. And again, one of the key things I always want to remind people, we're always going to do at the top, is we need to continue to practice social distancing. So just like I was instructing with Julie and Trevor, stay six feet apart from people when you're, where you're out in public. Uh, make sure you wash your hands often. Wear a mask when you go to the store is always going to be a good idea. In Japan, they've got uh, the three C's that they're reminding people about, which I think is a good thing for us to think about here as well, which is avoid confined spaces, uh, avoid big crowds, avoid close contact. And those are all great opportunities to be able to wear a mask when you're doing that. Uh, if you're sick, stay home. If somebody in your family's in sick, stay home. If you're uh, exposed to somebody, again, we want you to quarantine and get tested. So. Please continue to follow those rules. We also want to remind people with regard to our hospitalizations, again, by following these social distancing rules, we have been able to slow the spread of the virus here in Nebraska and preserve our hospital system. That's what all this has been about. And so if you look today, we're at 40% of our beds are available in hospitals, 48% of our uh, ICU beds are available, and 79% of our ventilators are available. And in fact, we've got this handy dandy chart. So this is available. This is the public dashboard that we've got out there on the DHHS website. So if you go to dhhs.ne.gov slash coronavirus and click on the, you know, the updates for us, you get this chart and you can get it where you can see right here, these are active hospitalizations. Going back to uh, April 25th this is the last time we had data. And you can see we peaked here about May 27th, and we've been coming down, and that's a good thing. We want to see fewer people hospitalized. In fact, we got about 117 people uh, hospitalized as of last night, and that is the lowest number we've had since probably the third week of April. So that's all very good. Uh, if you go there, you'll see our case counts are also have been very stable for the last few weeks. So that is very good. In fact, uh, do we still have the fourth lowest mortality rate in the country, Dr. Anton? Yes. So we've got the fourth lowest mortality rate in the country. So all very, all very good pieces of data. And of course, we've also got the lowest unemployment rate in the country at 5.2%, um, which is three points better than Utah, which is I think at 8.5%. So we've really struck a good balance here in Nebraska as far as slowing the spread of virus, allowing people to go back to a more normal life. But folks, it only happens if you continue to socially distance. That's the whole key to this. If you want to see Husker football this fall, continue the social distancing. Six feet apart, wear a mask when you go to the store, that kind of thing. That's what allows us to be successful. So please continue to remind that. And then, of course, we've got a holiday weekend coming up, so a lot of people are going to be traveling. If you are exposed while you're traveling, again, always a good thing to remember is test Nebraska. So please stay home, quarantine if you get exposed to somebody who's had coronavirus, and sign up for testnebraska.com to get tested until you get that test result back. So that's another great way to slow the spread of the virus. So please, folks, please do not forget our rules. We are seeing the spread of uh, coronavirus in southern states and so forth. I think that, again, we got to continue. We got to be vigilant. We've done very well here in Nebraska. We got to continue to be vigilant with regard to the slowing the spread of the virus by practicing our non-pharmaceutical interventions, our NPIs, those things we talk about with social distancing, the six feet away, wearing a mask, washing your hands, all that sort of good stuff. Please continue to do that. That is how we've been successful. We want to continue to be successful. So um, also uh, just a reminder that of the four counties that we've had up here on the chart in the past, uh, Hamilton, Merrick, Hall, and Dakota County will be moving into phase three on July 6th. And again, a good reminder of why we need to continue to practice social distancing, especially in those counties. So, but very excited to have them as a part of that. All right, so kind of our standard messages out of the way there. Now, today we're going to have both uh, the DMV and History of Nebraska to come up here and talk about what they've got going on. We're going to start with the Department of Motor Vehicles. So you may recall that back in March, I signed some executive orders that waived the requirements of getting driver's licenses uh, renewed, uh, vehicle registration and titling and so forth. Well, over the course of the last several months, we've been able to start loosening those restrictions. Uh, we've had more county office buildings open up. 
Uh, we've been able at the DMV to continue to provide those services through our service centers that have been open the entire time. And then we've also been able to do a lot of these things online, so you can still do those online. Uh, we waive the requirement for folks who are 72 and older to get their driver's license renewed till the end of the year. That one will stay in place. But as we've been able to start opening up our facilities, we've been adding on staff, extending hours, and we got the online option. Uh, we've been trying to be more flexible with regard to those sort of things. We've been able to provide those services and really get back up to capacity again. And so we are going to be changing um, the D or those executive orders so that we're going to put a, a deadline now of August 31st to be able for folks to be able to get their driver's license renewed, get that vehicle registered or titled or whatever. So August 31st, two months from now approximately, is when how much longer people will have to have those things waived. So by the end of August, everybody should have the expectation that if your driver's license expired, you need to catch up on it. If your you know, vehicle needs to be registered, you need to catch up on it. So end of August. Julie Maskey, who is our deputy director uh, at the Department of Motor Vehicles, is going to come and give us more details about that. So Julie, please come up and give us a little bit more with regard to what's going to be going on at the DMV, because it's always a great day at the DMV, right? Always a great day at the DMV. Always a great day at the DMV. All right. Please tell Rhonda we said that, because then she'll be really excited. I will do. Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of the State Department of Motor Vehicles, we thank Governor Ricketts for his ongoing leadership and support as we have worked to establish new practices and to keep our teammates and customers safe. On March 19th, the governor issued an executive order extending the expiration date for driver licenses, state identifications, vehicle titling and registration requirements, and other driving credentials. With county and state services nearing full capacity, the decision has been made to lift the order. The original order gave residents 30 days to renew or obtain their documents from the time that the order was lifted. The governor has now doubled that amount of time to two months. This means individuals who driver's license or state identification cards issued beginning March 1st will need to renew their licenses by October 30, excuse me, by August 31st. The vast majority of these drivers are able to complete their renewal online and I would strongly encourage them to take advantage of this convenient customer option. Just to be clear, the change does not affect the separate executive order which was signed on May 26th, which extended the expiration date of driver's licenses for those aged 72 or older, whose license expired between March 1 and December 31 of 2020. For these drivers, their driver license will remain valid for one year after the expiration date that's printed on the license. No action is needed by these folks at this time. The lifting of the order will also affect those residents who purchased a new vehicle or who need to renew their vehicle registration. New owners will need to work with their local county treasurer's office to complete the titling and registration process and to pay any sales tax due by August 31st. If someone purchases a vehicle after August 1st, they will have the normal 30 days to complete the process. Residents who need to renew their expired vehicle registration will also need to ensure that they are up to date by August 31st. Once again, online renewals provide a quick avenue for Nebraskans to complete this transaction. Lastly and again, I would like to remind our residents of the numerous electronic services available on the Nebraska Department of Motor Vehicles website at DMV nebraska.gov. We have asked Nebraskans to go online when possible and they have responded. We have seen a 55 percent increase in the use of our online services for driver licensing and a 47 percent increase for vehicle registration renewals. This frees up time for our offices for those who must conduct their business in person. We are incredibly grateful and it has been very helpful that these people have chosen this service option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Appreciate it. Again, so is that, uh, you said dmv.nebraska.gov, is that Nebraska spelled out or any? It's spelled out. Nebraska spelled out, all right, great. Next, we're gonna have Trevor, Trevor Jones from History Nebraska come up and talk to us about what History Nebraska is doing to document the pandemic. Now. We have not had a pandemic like this in our country since 1918 and the 
what was then called the Spanish flu. Now, that pandemic, uh, that flu actually was more deadly than what we're dealing with with the coronavirus here. But still, this is a historic time where we've got all sorts of uh, events going on here, and we've got History Nebraska to be able to help document. So Trevor, will you come up and talk to us a little bit about what you're doing to help future Nebraskans remember what happened during these historic times? All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Trevor Jones. I'm director and CEO of History Nebraska, which is the state's historical society. And the first thing I want to let you know is that we are reopening all of our facilities across the state starting on Tuesday, July 7th. And you can learn more about our opening hours at history.nebraska.gov. Um, and we really hope that you will visit us soon. It's been hard for us to be closed, and we are ready to be open. Uh, so I'd like to share with you about what we've been doing uh, to save materials related to this year. And I think it's certain that 2020 is a year that's going to be remembered for a very long time. And I think if we're lucky, Nebraska school children someday will be assigned to find somebody who has lived through 2020 and they will come and find you and ask you what was it like to live through that year and report back to their class. That's how significant this year is. We are all creating history right now. And so the question that we've been asking ourselves is, what would you keep so that future Nebraskans could understand our lives right now at this moment? What would, should we save? And so we've been working to answer that question for the past few months, and we're trying to document and preserve the experiences of everybody in Nebraska. So we've been busy. We've collected banners honoring high school students who did not get to have a graduation ceremony. We've been collecting journals of children uh, for, written by children who've been learning from home. And we've even collected rolls of toilet paper that were given out free um, for getting an oil change. Uh, so everything you can imagine from the pandemic we've been collecting. But we're still looking for more items uh, so that future generations can understand this tumultuous year. We've actually asked for these signs that you see next to me as well when they're done with them. So if you have artwork or you are keeping a video diary or you have photos to share, please let us know. If you have protest signs, if you have masks that you've made uh, that you're not using or when you're not using it, or art that represents how uh, Nebraskans have responded to the year's challenges, History Nebraska would very much like to talk with you. And we're especially looking for people that have some of these things outside of the Lincoln and Omaha area. We've done pretty well in Lincoln and Omaha, but if you're from around the state and you have documentations of things like a drive-in concert, for example, or a drive-in church service or things like that from places that are not Lincoln in Omaha, we're especially interested in talking with you. So to donate something to us or to learn more, you can go to history.nebraska.gov, and that's Nebraska spelled out, Governor. Uh, and by contributing your story, you will become part of Nebraska's history for generations to come. So thank you, and we hope to hear from you. Great. Thank you very much, Trevor. And one of the things you also should be collecting is the journals of parents who have been homeschooling their kids through the pandemic. <laughs> so if you got one of those, Trevor just said he'd take those as well. All right, great. Uh, now I just want to hit upon something with regard to some additional good news. Uh, the Annie E. Casey Foundation every year ranks states with regard to their child welfare system and child well-being. It's a 2020 kids count this year, 2020 kids count has Nebraska moving up from number 12 to number nine based on, on improvements that we've had in economic well-being, health, and then the family community category. So good news for Nebraska, and I want to thank the folks in the Department of Health and Human Services and Child, Children and Family Services for their work to be able to help take care of Nebraska's kids. And also, I really want to especially call out the folks in our community collaboratives because they are doing so much important work, working together with all the government entities, nonprofits, private businesses, everybody pulling together in their local communities to be able to help families out. That's really, really important. So I want to say thanks to all our community collaboratives there. So Bring Up Nebraska is a big part of that. Uh, great effort. So thanks to all the folks who are involved with Bring Up Nebraska. All right. So we moved up there. Uh, also want to just announce that we will be doing a 3 p.m. Spanish language briefing immediately after this. So we'll try and wrap this up a little bit before the 3 o'clock hour. And then we will have a 10 a.m. news conference on Monday. And that is probably the time we'll start going to uh, 
on a regular basis from now on, 10 a.m. on Mondays. And we will, on Monday, have Game and Parks coming in and talking about what they're doing with regard to reopening and the opportunities to be able to use their facilities. I know a lot of people, uh, you know, air travel is obviously not something people are doing a lot of, certainly aren't doing inter international travel. travel. Great time to travel to stay in Nebraska and see all that we've got. We've talked about the Department of Tourism and their passport program. Um, one of my best family vacations I took with my family is throwing the kids in the car and driving around the state and seeing all the great things we have here. So uh, taking advantage of our Game and Parks facilities is another great way to be able to enjoy the summer here in Nebraska. All right, now we're going to go on to Q&A. Uh, we'll start with questions that were submitted. Aaron Duffy, the Omaha World Herald, will Nebraska ask travelers from Texas, Arizona, California, or other hotspot states to self-quarantine as other states, including Kansas, New York, and New Jersey have done? Uh, we have no plans to ask people who are traveling to, uh, to specific hotspots to do that. But I would say, that, again, it gets back to our regular rules. If you are traveling and you have been exposed to somebody who you know has got coronavirus, quarantine, you know, follow all the same rules we ask you to do, quarantine, Sign up for testnebraska.com. If you haven't, update your profile in nebraska.com. If you have already signed up for testnebraska.com, get tested and stay home until you get that test result back. So that's part of the ways, that, again, we slow the spread here in our state. So please follow those rules as you're traveling this holiday weekend. Becca Costello from NET, uh, several questions here. The race ethnicity data published online shows that minority populations are being disproportionately impacted. We, uh, that's something we talked about about a month ago. What has the state done within the last month to reach out to these communities? So we actually started early on with regard to different communities to be able to reach out to them. Again, one of the reasons why we have the Spanish language broadcast to be able to communicate to our Spanish-speaking Nebraskans with regard to what we're doing to slow the spread and what they can do to help do that. Uh, we've actually published uh, a number of videos with regard to what you can do to protect yourself and your family, not only in Spanish um, and English, but also in French and Arabic and Somali and Karen and so forth. So reaching out to different other communities with regard to what we're doing here at the state. Uh, we have uh, focused our, our plans on at-risk communities and involved our food processing plants, which uh, uh, have a lot of Hispanic folks that are w working in those uh, facilities. So we have plans around that. We offer folks in the food processing industry the opportunity to be able to uh, find a place to stay if they don't feel comfortable going home, either because there's somebody at home with coronavirus or they don't want to bring it back to the home, just like we do for our healthcare workers and our first responders and so forth. So we do that. Uh, we've worked with our community uh, or our local public health departments in reaching out to different community organizations to be able to help reach out to minority communities. So for example, working with our healthcare clinics that are you know, the trusted face in those communities oftentimes to be able to help do education, to be able to reach out and do testing. So for example, we've uh, worked with One World and Charles Drew in Omaha to be able to provide more test kits or to do more testing and so forth to be able to make sure we're reaching out to those communities. So there's a number of different things that we've done with regard to reaching out to minority communities to help make sure that we're providing the resources or the education or whatever it would be to be able to help uh, and lessen the impact of coronavirus, understanding that if English is not your first language, this may not be, this press briefing may not be the best venue to be able to reach those communities. So we try to find other ways to be able to do that. Uh, the CDC now requires states to report demographic information on all COVID-19 tests, including patient race and ethnicity. Uh, will the state be able to provide that information? And will it soon be included on the state's data dashboard? So uh, again, uh, last month we talked about the race ethnicity data. It is now on the public dashboard. There is a portion of that that is not reported. Uh, again, we can't force people to report that if they don't want to report it, but we do try to catch that when we're doing contact tracing and so forth. And so we will continue to make efforts to be able to provide more complete data. But again, we can't force somebody to report that if they don't want to report it. We will try and capture it, however. Uh, please provide updated information on the number of coronavirus cases and deaths in long-term care facilities and among our food processing plants. So Dr. Antone, you generally have got that data on hand, so I'll ask you to come up and give us a briefing on that. I'll give the uh, long-term care data first, and this is uh, current as of uh, yesterday. Uh, the number of residents in long-term care facilities that have tested positive is 636. The number of staff members at long-term care facilities is 552 that have tested positive. And we have 152 facilities 
out of a total of 496 in Nebraska that have either a positive resident or positive staff member in their facility, at their facility. And uh, deaths are 113 deaths with one death pending validation at this time. We're also keeping a rolling two-week average of our long-term care facility data. And uh, over the last two weeks, we've had uh, 16 residents test positive, 15 staff mem members, and one death, and uh, nine new facilities that have been affected by COVID positive. And when we trend that over the last several weeks, it's been very, very stable. There's not been a really big increase or a big decrease in those numbers. As far as meat processing plants are concerned, we've had a total of 4,596 confirmed cases and 18 deaths and 208 hospitalizations, which also has been very, very steady, very few increase uh, over the last several weeks. So um, everything looks good there. I want to just tell Trevor that when all this is over, I'll be glad to donate all my paperwork to you, Trevor. So. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Antone. And Dr. Antone, our Chief Medical Officer for the state. Don Walton from the General Star asks, do you anticipate the like, or what, or do you anticipate the likelihood of a coronavirus surge in Nebraska as it continues to spike in other states? And if so, what action are you prepared to take? So we are obviously, again, let's go back and just say, hey, we're in very good shape right now, folks, with regard to the cases being stable, lowest hospitalizations we've had since the third week of April. We've got uh, cases being sta uh, you know, stable, fourth lowest mortality rate, and of course our lowest unemployment rate in the country. If we could stay like that till the end of the year, I would be ecstatic. But it only happens if we continue to do our social distancing. That's why we continue to talk about that at the top of every one of these. So do we anticipate that going up? Well, if we all practice social distancing and stay that six feet apart, wear a mask when you go to the store, wash your hands often, we can actually mitigate the opportunities for that to happen. Now. Having said that, we are looking at what's going on in other states, and we see that a lot of the cases have to do with young people. So again, if you're a young person, please pay particular attention to your social distancing. If you're gonna go out to the bars on a Friday or Saturday night and the bar is crowded, pick a different one. That would be a good choice to make. Go to a different bar, try and find one that's gonna be not so crowded. So that's like an ex example of how you can try and manage this and really help make sure we're slowing the spread here in the state. Uh, we are looking at what we can do with regard to uh, other things to mitigate that. And, and again, it just gets back to the kind of the blocking and tackling the basis of epidemiology around testing, testnebraska.com. We've uh, got 197,700 people that have signed up for that. We've done over 600,000, had 600,000 assessments. Uh, we've scheduled 72,000 plus appointments, done 65,000 plus tests. Again, test Nebraska. If you want just about any, you know, we've lifted all the restrictions on getting tested, so anybody can get a test if you sign up for testnebraska.com. That's a way for us to continue to monitor the conditions going on in the state, so we want people to continue to sign up for testnebraska.com. It's a great way for every Nebraskan to participate in slowing the spread of coronavirus here. And when we do find somebody who is tested positive, we want them to isolate, stay home. Our contact tracers will work with them with regard to that and then find out who they've been in touch with over the last two weeks so we can get those people to either quarantine or monitor their symptoms, whatever's gonna be appropriate. That's the kind of the blocking and tackling that we have to do here in Nebraska to be able to limit the spread of any surge that might happen down the road. So those are the things we're continuing to, to look at and monitor to see what we can do to make improvements. We've got process improvement teams that are working on that. Uh, we're working on contracts to be able to expand contact tracing. We've got over 900 people now that are trained to do contact tracing in the state. That includes our local public health departments that are sitting at about 218 people that they've got staffed. Uh, we've got 275 people at the state that are trained within our Department of Health and Human Services. Most of them have gone back to their day jobs now. And so we're looking to work with those private companies like uh, uh, PRC and Emeritus and IGT that are uh, there to be able to do that contact tracing. So again, we want to make sure that we've got the resources that we can deploy those contract, uh, contact tracers to the local public health departments should we see a spike so we can quickly run down where that's happening and get those folks to isolate. So those are some of our strategies that we're going to be thinking about with regard to how we're going to handle if there starts to be a resurgence of the coronavirus here in Nebraska. Uh, we will certainly keep all other options uh, open as well on 
you know, uh, anything we need to do if we think we need to, but really it's going to be the frontline defense is going to be that testing and contact tracing. So again, why it's important to sign up for testnebraska.com. And with that, we've run out of questions. Uh, Taylor, do we have any texted in? So Martha Stotter and a couple of other uh, reporters were asking for comments with regard to the test uh, or with rather the, the ballot initiatives for uh, expanded gambling and for uh, the marijuana. And again, I think, uh, again, Nebraskans obviously will uh, make their decision when they go to the polls, but with regard to, say, gambling, Nebraskans have rejected that historically. Just to remind Nebraskans that folks, um, for every dollar you collect in tax revenue and gambling, you spend three in social services, increase child abuse, increase spousal abuse, embezzlement. There are all sorts of social problems that come along with expanded gambling, which is why Nebraska has, and Nebraskans have historically rejected expanding gambling here in the state. I certainly support rejecting expanded gambling and would encourage other Nebraskans to uh, support rejecting it as well. And then with regard to marijuana, again, we have a process here in the country called the Food and Drug Administration. What they do to make sure drugs are safe and effective in certain quantities with known side effects and to go around that process will put Nebraskans' health and safety at risk. This is, we have a process in place to keep people safe through the FDA. That's the process should be followed. Derivatives of marijuana like Epidiolex have followed that process. That's what needs to continue to happen going forward. This is an attempt by big tobacco and the, or sorry, the big marijuana and tobacco, which often owns these companies, to go around that process and not be regulated. This is a pro, a pro, this petition ballot is a way to circumvent regulation. So I ask Nebraskans to consider that when they're thinking about this. There is a process that these drugs can go through. That's what it should go through, just like every other drug should be treated just the same way. And this is an effort by commercial firms to avoid regulation. So again, encourage people to take that in consideration as they're going to the ballot box and evaluating this. Uh, Martha, I was also curious to know if you plan to be involved with opposition efforts um, for either of these. So Martha want, uh, also wants to know if I'm going to be involved in opposition efforts, and certainly I think my position is pretty clear on these. Uh, I am opposed to it, and so uh, we'll continue to talk to Nebraskans about the harm that will be caused to Nebraskans by both of these ballot initiatives. Was there something else on that, Taylor? Oh, okay. Uh, Paula at Fox 42 would like to know what can Nebraska do to ensure that we don't become like Texas and New York in California where services are shutting down again? So Paul at Fox 42, Fox 42 wants to know what we can, we can do to uh, make sure Nebraska doesn't end up like some of the southern states where they've had to walk back some of the loosening of restrictions they've had and so forth, and they see the, the cases going up and so forth. Same kind of answer I just gave to Don Walton. Folks, if you want to see Husker football this fall, wear a mask when you go to the store. Stay six feet apart from other people. Wash your hands often. Our non-pharmaceutical interventions, these things we do that are called social distancing, all help us to make sure we slow the spread of the virus here in the state. Avoid those confined spaces with people you don't know. Avoid crowded places. Avoid close contact with people you don't know. These are all the things that we can all participate in to make sure we slow the spread here in the state. And then as well at the state, we're going to be looking at continuing to beef up our contact tracing, uh, our contact or our testing, kind of the blocking and tacking, tackling of what we do for epidemiology to be able to make sure when we do have somebody who tests positive, we get them to isolate so they don't infect other people in the community. So David Earl from KETV wants to know about uh, U.S. Immigration Services that is uh, put out a notice that they're going to start furloughing people on August 3rd, and I believe this is in response to that as an agency that is driven primarily by fees that are paid to people that are coming to this country. And again, if we've got our borders essentially closed so that people can't come here, they've not been collecting the fees, and so they don't have the resources to be able to continue to run their operations. And um, Again, I, this is a federal issue. I would encourage Congress to take a look at this very closely with regard to what we need to do, what kind of services are essential for them to provide, and for Congress to take the appropriate action. Okay, questions from folks here in the audience. Paul? You're always good at starting. Yeah, one follow-up on the marijuana and gambling. Do you plan to put money, invest money? 
so Paul's asking, do I plan to put money into uh, opposing those efforts? I don't have any plans currently. I don't believe there's any organizations, political organizations that are organized to oppose those, but I certainly may look at that option down the road if those organizations form. Is there a group of organizations that put out some warning signs about medical So I thought you were talking specifically about the ballot initiatives, right? right. Right, so I may, I may do all of that, may do all of the above, put money into educating people, may put money into uh, putting into the political opposition as well. So uh, Paul's asking about the a tape that was about uh, taping our Republican Party Chair Dan Welch talking about on a phone call about how the governor wanted to go after uh, Janet Palmtag. And uh, folks, I support our incumbents like Julie Salama. I've interviewed Janet Palmtag. She's not conservative. And so, yes, I wanted to make sure that Julie Salama did very well in that primary. And I want to make sure that she wins the general election because she's the right person for Legislative District 1. Janet Palmtag is wrong on the issues on a number of different things. She's for gun control. She wants to give SNAP benefits to felons. She's generally soft on crime. Uh, that's not the kind of person who's right for that legislative district. So absolutely, I, I am supporting Julie uh, Slama 100% and I'm working to make sure Janet Palmtag doesn't go anywhere. Did you approve of the uh, mailing that was sent out? So the question was, did I approve of the mailing? The process is not such that I approve or check off on the mailings that the Nebraska Republican Party send out, but I support what they're doing. So, and I think Dan's wrong. I think, I think they're all appropriate. I think the record is very clear where Janet Palmstag stands. She is not a conservative. She's got some very liberal views. She stands with liberals on a number of these issues. I think all those mailers were absolutely appropriate. So you didn't you disagree with Welch? Or I disagree with Welch, absolutely. Dan's wrong on that. You were at a baseball game last night. So did Westside win? Westside won. Good deal. So the question Paul is asking is he was at a baseball game last night, Miller North West Side, my alma mater West Side won, and yet there were still a lot of people, not very many people were wearing masks, kids were clumping together. What do, full. The seats were pretty full. What do we need to do about that? So first of all, I would ask the, the organizations putting on those events like that, look at our guidelines and please try to help make sure you're ensuring social distancing. So the responsibility is really to start, starts with the organizer of those, of those events. Folks, look, if you want to continue to have baseball games or see Husker games, the organizers of the events have to work on making sure we're providing social distancing. But again, what we've done through this entire pandemic was also ask Nebraskans to take personal responsibility for doing this as well. So this is why I start off all my press briefings by saying, hey folks, we gotta continue to socially distance. So I encourage Nebraskans to be able to do that. And so my next question, Paul, is if you saw there was all those people there without wearing masks and it was crowded, why did you stay? You should have turned around and left. And that's what I encourage other Nebraskans to do too, that if you see there's an event where there's a lot of people and you're concerned about people not wearing masks, they're not staying, you know, family groups aren't staying six feet apart, things like that, go someplace else, right? That, that's a good opportunity to say, the venue's too full already, I'll go do something else. I use that example with the bars, but it applies to everybody. If you see an event that's crowded, it's a good opportunity to either wear a mask and make sure other people are wearing masks, and if they're not, then maybe choose another alternative. Other questions? Folks in the back. Okay, if you guys are quiet, Paul's just gonna keep asking questions. All right, Paul, you got any other questions? What about using a tent for the cash now to help feed families? Oh. Cash has been built up. Some organizations are asking now, 
So uh, the question was about the TANF monies or the temporary aid for needy families money that we have a cash balance there and uh, some organizations are called to spend that money. And in fact, actually going back to 2015, uh, former state Senator Kathy Campbell and I have worked on a bill because we had a balance then to start paying out more to the families with regard to that. So I think we have to keep in perspective that this is something that we have increased the payouts to families going back to 2015, and we want to make sure we can continue to do that for the foreseeable future. So we are managing that, that fund along those lines. Uh, we're going to continue to examine the balance and do the analysis on it if there's more that we think we can do with that, and we'll certainly take those steps to do it. But I think we also got to remember as we did commit you know, five years ago to be able to increase the amount of aid going to needy families, we want to make sure we can continue to make that commitment for the foreseeable future. So there's a lawsuit fi filed against the folks who, the conglomerate that created Test Nebraska as well as Test Utah and Test Iowa and so forth, and the, it's a lo shareholder lawsuit saying they misled investors. I can't really comment on that. Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's not, actually doesn't directly deal with Test Nebraska, and that's a lawsuit that we don't, we just generally don't comment on pending lawsuits. The question is, do I put much credence in shareholder lawsuits? And again, it just I can't comment on the lawsuit. All right, anybody else? Paul, any other questions before we wrap up? Because we're going to wrap up if you don't have any. Um, I know, it's kind of unusual, right, Paul? <laughs> uh, I don't watch Rachel Maddow, so I couldn't tell you what she said. So a uh, question Paul asked, what's my opinion of masks and how often do I wear a mask? So masks are a tool just like every other tool we have with regard to these non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, when we talk about keeping six feet apart and distance, wearing a mask when you go to the store, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, these are all things that we should do to be able to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska and everybody can participate in doing that. So I wear a mask, for example, when I go to the store. So I went to go buy my wife a, a, a birthday present, I wore a mask in to go do that. If I go to the grocery store, I'd wear a mask to go do that. Uh, when I was taking the tour at the Nebraska Public Health Lab, that was another great example where I used a mask. So again, it depends on the circumstances. We just had a meeting with the state fair. Um, when I went up to their boardroom, I wore a mask because it was an enclosed space, right? We are gonna be a bunch of people in an enclosed space. When we went outside to do the press conference and we could be six feet apart, I took my mask off because then I had I'd not only speak, but we could be six feet apart and we were outside in a non-enclosed space. So again, what I think that Nebraskans ought to do is, just like we've done, you know, I'll analogize this to the stay-at-home order. We were one of the states that didn't do a stay-at-home order, but we did ask people to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Same thing, we're asking people to use their common sense and good judgment. You know, you, you, use your good judgment about using a mask. If you can be more than six feet apart from somebody and be outside, you probably don't need it. But if you're gonna be inside, especially in an enclosed space, and you can't stay six feet apart, that's a good opportunity to wear a mask. So- You seem to still be criticized for not allowing local governments to make that decision if they want to mandate it. So, and then question about the local government, specifically, it wasn't all local government, specifically the counties. And counties, the taxpayers already paid their property taxes. I didn't delay that, even though a lot of people were asking me to do that, but, uh, we didn't delay the first property, uh, first payment property taxes, so taxpayers paid their, for their property taxes and for our counties to be able to provide those services. And so while I think it's absolutely appropriate for a county to ask people to wear masks and to provide a mask uh, when they go in, well, we, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles are coming in, we have, have you know, we'll encourage you to wear a mask, but to, uh, to require it to get government services that taxpayers have already paid for, I'm, a, I'm opposed to that and the counties still do have a choice. If they want to forego the CARES Act, then they can make that a requirement, but they won't be eligible for the CARES Act money to, to cover their expenses with regard to coronavirus. So the counties still do have a choice. Sure. So they just have to decide how they want to do it. So, 
So the question was, with regard to the CARES Act, when that passed, it provided for certain tax changes at the federal level. And because Nebraska links our tax code to the federal tax code, uh, this is one of the reasons why when the federal tax code changed from April 15th to July 15th, we did follow suit on that. And the question was, you know, should Nebraska continue to follow the CARES Act, which over the course of three years would result in the loss of about $250 million in tax revenues? I think in the first year it's $125 million. Uh, should we continue to follow what the CARES Act did, which would result in the loss of $125 million in fiscal year 2021? Or should we decouple that and not follow those taxes? Uh, we haven't made a decision with regard to that, and I think it's all part of the negotiation that will go on with regard to property taxes and incentives and all the things we'll be talking about in the upcoming legislative session. I, I, you know what, I, 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 think it's, I think it's on the table to be negotiated. So I, I think it's, on, it's up there, but I think it'll be part of the overall picture of what we do with regard to taxes and incentives and so forth. Ah. Question in the back, yes. Sure. So the question was from Ashley Channel 8 that, uh, you know, there's families who say, hey, my loved one might benefit from being able to smoke marijuana. Uh, and I would go back to, you know, again, what we want to do is make sure that the, the drugs that we're allowing people to use are safe and effective, that they we know what the side effects are going to be. We know uh, how much the drug should be delivered for what specific ailments. And that's not the case for marijuana. That's a, an, you know, an illegal, illegal drug that they're, are ways to make it legal, like process it into things like Epidiolex, uh, Epidiolex, whatever, however you pronounce it. But that's a drug that's a derivative from uh, cannabis, and it can be made safe and legal because it goes through the FDA process. What we see here, though, is with these companies, these marijuana companies, many of them owned by uh, big tobacco companies, they're trying to go around the regulatory process. They're trying to escape regulation. And so that's putting Nebraskans at risk when you do that. And so you're actually maybe putting your family member at risk because they're really trying to avoid that regulation to make sure that whatever drug we provide to somebody is safe and effective. Time for just a couple more questions. Two more questions. Brandon? So for more of the you know, 25 posting rules, is there any sort of advice that you could give someone who's looking at hosting a book like Barnes and how they follow, you know, probably not knowing the occupancy of their home? You know, right. So the question was, uh, any advice to people who are having a Fourth of July party? And again, I'd go back to the same things we're talking about. You know, again, if you're, I would certainly encourage folks to have that celebration with immediate family members. Your household will be best. If you're going to expand it, please try to keep social distancing. Do that celebration outside so people can have that room to stay six feet apart. Please keep these things in mind as you're doing it. Uh, you know, and you can, uh, you know, do all the other things with regard to making sure people can wash their hands often, if you've got hand sanitizer available. I mean, all, use your common sense and good judgment on this, folks, that we know how the virus spreads. It spreads through uh, droplets that, you know, come out of your respiratory system. So when you cough or talk or sneeze or sing or anything like that, you're potentially sending virus out if you've been infected. So if you can minimize that by keeping that six feet away, that's going to make all the difference in the world. So think about ways that you can socially distance so you stay away from that and actually limit the number of people that you're going to have, and that will all help us slow the spread of coronavirus. Last question. Last question. All right, Paul. It looks like you get it. Well, if you don't have any, I'm not going to make you. All right, you got one more. Oh, so the question was, some people say my stand-up mass is uh, to appease the president who's not a big fan of mass. Actually, my stand-up mass uh, is in line with what we've, everything we've done here in the state with regard to asking people to use common sense and good judgment to lay out kind of the conditions when it's a good idea to wear a mask. Like we just laid out, you know, when you're going to the store, that's a great opportunity to wear a mask, right? Uh, whenever you're going to be closer than six feet from somebody inside, that's a great opportunity to use a mask. So I think it's just about common sense and good judgment and asking people to do the right thing.
you know, ask Nebraskans to do the right thing. That's what happened when we did the stay at home, and that's what we're doing with this too. It's nothing to do with the president. All right, folks, thank you all again for being here this afternoon. Thank you to all the Nebraskans who have sacrificed to implement these social distancing rules, to you know, follow the six-foot guideline, who've worn masks to stores, who've washed their hands off, and who've stayed home when they're sick. Thank you to all the Nebraskans who have sacrificed to slow the spread of coronavirus here in our state. It has been successful. Now, for us to continue to be successful, we need to continue to do it. So please continue to do that. Please sign up for testnebraska.com. And of course, it's a holiday weekend, so I hope everybody has a great 4th of July holiday. Please stay safe. If you're traveling, buckle up, drive the speed limit, all those sort of good things that we talk about staying safe that have nothing to do with coronavirus. They still work, too. We still want you to do that. But uh, please enjoy the Independence Day holiday, and we will see you all back here again next week. Thank you very much, and God bless.